too, by the way. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to our workshop, which is entitled The GIS Platform Supporting Better Decision Making. Um, we tried to condense a lot of program into 90 minutes, but this is just supposed to be some sort of summary. We have a booth during the conference, and whenever you want to pick up on some details, please join us there, and we'll be happy to discuss it in much more length as deemed appropriate. My name is Günter Pichler from ESRI, and I'd like to introduce my colleague Roberto Lucchi from our headquarter in California. Uh, Roberto used to be with the JRC team, Inspire team, and he joined us five years ago and is now ArcGIS for Inspire product manager. First slide, please. Just want to briefly show you the outline of this workshop. We'll introduce the notion of WebGIS and what it means to support better decision making and its processes, then briefly cover our product ArcGIS for Inspire, but that focus on several real use case stories. Um, and we have some colleagues here. We have Fra Lucian Savate from, he's the technical director of ESRI Romania, our Romanian affiliate. And he is presenting on a national Inspire implementation in Romania with the National Mapping and Cadastral Agency there. Then we have Mark Döring from Conterra, specialist on extract, transform, load, uh, schema transformation. He will give a presentation on inspired data harmonization. And last but not least, we have Clemens Portele, who has many hats on, one of which is he's a managing director of Interactive Instruments, uh, our German business partner, <coughs> but he's also uh, for instance, chairing the data specification drafting team. Clemens will provide an overview on the ELF project, the European Location Framework, and our role in there. And then we'll just wrap up and, as mentioned before, invite you to the booth. So without any further ado, please, Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gunther. Hi, everyone. Um, so RJS, uh, as you can see here in the verticals, is, is providing a number of different functionality. Maybe you are really very well familiar with it, but there are some new topics that you may find here, like real time or imagery with, with uh, processing capabilities. Um, and, um, and of course, more classic one like mapping and, and uh, 3D and analysis. Uh, the deployment pattern of RGS is, is uh, growing in terms of uh, options, and you still have the, let's say, the personal type of uh, single user type of pattern that, that applies to, you have uh, personal files, your databases, and you use RGS desktop, but you can then move to the database-centric pattern within the organization and move gradually uh, as, as your organization is uh, getting larger or, or the teams are getting uh, more distributed, then you can move to server-centric, where you have more than a database shared across users, but you have also geoprocessing tools, analysis, and so on. And then that, uh, the last one, which is the web-centric um, uh, deployment pattern, which is, which is what we are talking about and focusing today mostly. Um, so WebJS is the platform uh, and the pattern through which you provide GIS and maps uh, to everyone. So you can see here that we are starting uh, distinguishing, discriminating between type of users. So you have the GIS professionals uh, that are typically populating QA, uh, reviewing the data and, and making analysis, but then you have uh, uh, users, knowledge workers in the field, maybe uh, uh, in need of uh, for using different type of devices, uh, not only to view a map, but maybe to contribute or review a map. Uh, so it's not just the, the typical read-only uh, type of pattern, uh, but it's really uh, bi-directional interaction. And then executives, and again, 
probably need a, a sort of different tools, public, uh, that pretty typical uh, and common in, in SDI implementation like Inspire. And also, all those other systems that are within the organization that you may want to use or, or make accessible through the same platform. So the question is, uh, and, and I will go through slides that ex essentially explain how do we achieve that. And by the way, it would be interesting to, I know there is overlapping between these uh, kind of uh, user types, but it would be interesting to know um, how many GS professionals are, are here in the room. Okay, pretty large footprint. And uh, how many knowledge workers, or would you work on the field? Um, yeah, well, that's uh, not necessarily a, a pure GIS-centric type of workflow. You may you may just work on the field, review an inspector uh, or or uh, a data collector uh, in the field. So not many. Uh, so executives taking decisions out of maps. Okay. In, okay. Thank you. And uh, well, the public, everyone is is a citizen and and. Uh, ci and, um, so one of the key of the WebJS uh, pattern and the platform is to make sure that, as I said, you don't just get a map everywhere, but also you can actually do GIS everywhere. So um, it's people's choice, like we have in the statement. So we, we, can't, we can't impose what tools they have to use or device they have to use. We try to reach out through the WebJS, through HTTP web service interfaces, uh, uh, across different devices and, and uh, systems. Um, so here is like a, almost a carousel of apps, for example, that are uh, immediately available if you adopt the, the uh, platform WebJS uh, pattern. And as you can see, they focus on very specific tasks. You may just want to view uh, the assets, the maps that you have. You may want to um, build a story, and we'll see maybe an example of it later. You may want to build an app through a web app builder. So uh, that's one of the new applications that we have uh, in the platform from, from uh, about April. Um, open data, which is another way to expose data directly downloadable in different formats and, and explorer and so on. As, and as you can see, again, when we talk about users in the field, there is a, a star footnote that is basically, especially for those applications that are specifically designed for mobile phones or for, for mobile devices. So for those, you have all tools to work online and offline. So you may get in an area where you don't have access to your, um, to your live services and you have to cache locally, not only the data that is already available, but also the, the changes that you are going to apply to your data. And then you can check in again as, as soon as you can get to an online mode uh, uh, again. Uh, the, in addition to uh, this, this uh, uh, portfolio of apps, it's also important to bring the GIS maps also within other systems. So again, uh, for example, Microsoft Office, you may want to use uh, your maps within Office, within Excel, and also load additional layers. So that, that is the uh, environment where the user is already familiar with. So you want to reach out and give your maps also through, um, through Excel. And, and other systems like Microsoft SharePoint, which is a typical content management system for organization, or Drupal, uh, which is another content management system that uh, we support in terms of being able to expose through um, the framework, so in that case, Microsoft Office or, or uh, uh, IBM Cognos or SAP, other, other systems. Um, how to take informed decisions? So that's one of, of the key uh, elements of, of this presentation. Uh, well, first of all, you need to have authoritative data. You need to have very good uh, qualitatively and quantitatively uh, data. And We'll talk about this part, which, which is uh, a source of information that is, uh, uh, can be very important here. Um, and tools for analysis and modeling. Um, and, uh, uh, and a way, once you are done that, and that's typically a, a task that is assigned to a GS professional, a way to deliver. And again, not deliver many times. I'm sending a screenshot via email and then another one 
uh, uh, through Facebook, but just deliver once and then expose that in multiple environments. And that's the notion of web maps in uh, RJS uh, system. And then you may want to convey a very specific story for a decision maker um, that, that, uh, that just wants to have a very specific view of the information that is made available. Um, or monitor uh, even real-time data, like uh, uh, the uh, operation dashboard for RGS uh, that captures data on the fly through feature service or real-time services and can build not only maps but also charts and, and key performance indicators that you can use to take decisions. Um, and we have a, a number of application templates also. So here I'd like just to uh, uh, very quickly give you a couple of examples. So storymaps.se.com is, is the URL you can go through uh, where you can get a number of uh, different ways to tell a story out of a map. So in this case is uh, uh, the, the ecological footprint and the, the bio, bio capacity of each country and as a, a, a time dimension so you can actually see if things have changed over time. So this is one very, um, uh, very focused view of, of some data that is made available by Global Footprint Network that tells a story about each country and how they kind of balance, uh, you know, the production and the consumptions of natural resources. Um, another one is a little bit more uh, combining not only view but also analytical tools is a landscape modeler. So in this case, what happens here is that the application makes available uh, a number of layers and uh, here is uh, uh, an example of what layers are available and um, like elevation, soil, uh, flood and out of it you can make a, a classification of uh, uh, assigned weights to the layers that you deem important and then run on the fly a classification, multi-layer weighted uh, classification of, of, this, of the land. So you can use this to, for example, find correlations between uh, different uh, essential variables that are in your layers or just identify uh, suitable areas, right? So, and through this model you can also not only compute it, but also share or get other models that are built by others. So in this case, um, uh, development risk, I may want to load this and run the model again. And of course, as soon as I focus on a different area, I can, I, that's again uh, uh, a processing that, haps, that happens on the fly uh, with, with candidate area. Uh, a very focused app that I'd like to use as an example is uh, uh, for a special in Northern Ireland. They built this um, uh, database that basically maps uh, defibrillators, the, the ones that are uh, available, so that you can take a better decision on when and where it's the closest one or which one you have uh, around you. So that's a very focused application that is built, and, but you can imagine that you could also take this layer and use in other context. Um, what's behind this, this, uh, 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 this uh, set of application is, is a, a full platform which, which essentially in a very high level view is composed of online services and services could be base maps, it could be um, uh, routing uh, uh, services, it could be a print service uh, that are available for your application or for your organization and your server capabilities, the one that are serving your specific layers, your specific geospatial assets in, in, the, same, in the same platform, the WebJS platform. And, and of course you need, uh, there is an, uh, an additional component which is the portal that is uh, the, mecha <coughs> the mechanism through which you deliver uh, your maps, your information products. And again, those become available uh, in a mobile application, in a browser or uh, in your desktop for further analysis if you are a GS professional. So um, we'll switch now a little bit of topic because we need to essentially move from GS servers to really usable services, right? So that's, that's uh, uh, one topic here uh, uh, as part of the remaining part of the presentation. Uh, and what we leverage uh, primarily is uh, 
RGS server, but the same technology is available online. So you can opt for deploying on-premise. So if you, have, uh, if you work for an organization that has uh, capacity and IT infrastructure, you can deploy there. And uh, equivalent capabilities are available online as software as a service. So you just uh, use credits to essentially um, deploy and host some services. Um, and of course, you can secure, uh, secure individual services. You can create maps that are shared across groups or with everyone. And that really depends on the workflow that you are planning to use um, uh, for your JS project. Uh, <clears throat> so we go to uh, Inspire specifically. So uh, there is uh, an element of the platform that is specifically designed to help you meeting uh, the Inspire requirements. And we distinguish between immediate and long-term requirements because there are, uh, I will use a couple of examples for that, there are, there are different needs and, and approaches for implementing Inspire. Uh, so uh, here you see represented the, um, let's say, the milestones uh, divided by annexes that are for the download service. And you can imagine it's, it's um, uh, not only specifically for the download service interface, but it goes down to the level of uh, content. So you can see that we are in a phase now where you would have to deliver, let's say, the blue one, which is um, a service that doesn't necessarily have to have the harmonized data uh, exposed, but it could be just serving data as they are today. So, and, and you can see that as you move along the uh, 2015 or 17 or 2020, then you have more strict requirements and expectations for this part where you have uh, uh, to think about harmonizing the data and serve those. But you, ca you may decide to implement just what you need to do today and not necessarily what is required in 2017. So we, uh, we implement different options for you to uh, meet the requirements. In addition, for those uh, of you that are a little bit more technical, if you read the technical guidance, you have uh, within those options. So you have options for the view service. You may want to have a dynamic service that reproject, for example, your data in national uh, projections and uh, ETRS 89. Or you may want just to cache it and, and just serve the tiles as a very fast and, and a low CPU consuming uh, type of service. Um, for download, you have also options like WFS2 or the Atom, uh, the Atom uh, implementation. So here I'm going through essentially uh, the three options that the, uh, the RGS for Inspire provides for you to implement uh, um, Inspire network services. The first option, which is the, the easiest, and it's the one you can use to meet the immediate requirements, is the one where you can uh, use your content just to publish as is the data into a Inspire view and the load service. So that's an option that you can use to deliver uh, what is called Inspire compliant view and the load service, but using the data at the stage where, where you are at now, which is not harmonized data. Um, that's option number one. Um, op option number two is to use the Atom um, pattern, where you essentially export your data uh, it, um, in different formats, there is, there is a sort of a, a list of formats that are foreseen for this, and it could be a, 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 a SVG database, it could be a shapefile, it could be a GML, and those are getting published um, uh, through the Atom and the open search uh, endpoints that are used to meet the compliance as well. So those two patterns that I've been just presenting are uh, uh, fairly new in the product. We introduced those in, in uh, end of January. So you, um, that's, that's the part that uh, we have been focusing on lately. Um, the third pattern is um, use a geodatabase template that, that, uh, that uh, implements the data models that Inspire defines and use it to basically take your data, transform, uh, the data into that uh, database implementation of Inspire and then use it to basically deliver Inspire view service and Inspire download service compliant with the interface but also compliant with the data harmonization requirements. So this pattern is also available and again it meets longer term uh, goals that Inspire foresees. 
uh, if we look at the uh, the data themes in February or in April, they updated uh, in the GRC website, they updated the schemas or the application schemas for also Annex 2 and 3. And we started implementing some of those. We are working primarily on land cover and geology right now. And, um, and uh, those will become available. But as I said, you can already start sharing your data uh, through the other patterns. So that's very important and very important for the Inspire in general. Um, progress. So I'd like to pass uh, uh, the presentation to Lucian, who will talk about a specific project and implementation in Romania. Thank you, Lucian. Thank you, Roberto. Just a minute to get organized. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As Roberto already mentioned, you saw there are three patterns in which we can implement Inspire in, uh, using the WebGIS platform. In Roberto likes to keep me busy. When we began, Inspire, uh, when we began implementing this in uh, Romania back in 2009, we only had the first, the, the third um, approach. That meant, let me just go back a little bit, yeah, using the data that we have based on the geodatabase templates, harmonize the data, and based on, the, on those results, publish Inspire View and download services. Now we have to tackle the other two approaches. We'll see. So I'll, I'll, I'll just go through the whole implementation process that began in 2009. Uh, we had to leverage lots of existing information that were stored across different systems. Those were residing in NECPI. NECPI is the cadastral land, the National Agency for Cadastral and Re Land Registration Agency in Romania. So we had lots of data. We are not the uh, owners, uh, the responsible uh, party for the data, but still they assumed that role and tried to push the, the Inspire implementation further on. So. In their effort, they established a geo portal, the Romanian Inspire Geo Portal. This is a multi tenant Inspire Geo Portal. This means that the Geo Portal serves for different organizations that do not have the technical competencies or even the capacity to build their own Geo Portals. And the stakeholders that are part of the INIS Council, which was established in 2010, um, are. Or, um, are <coughs> structured in 19 organizations, and amongst that we have technical working group experts which address different parts of the INSPIRE implementation process. So the INSPIRE geo portal that uh, NCPI created is a mean in which um, all the 19 organizations can contribute to the um, effort of implementing an INSPIRE node in Romania. When we began actually discussing an Inspire node architecture, we began small with a, um, a very small cell which, which had only a few nodes in there, only a few servers in there. But then we, ha we uh, realized that we have to scale out. And we did that having in mind business continuity. We have to uh, address issues like recoverability, redundancy and maintainability. Also, the entire geoportal, as you will see, is built right now around data. We saw data being an asset that has to be shared, that has to be accessible, and also has to be secured. Um, as you will see in the next slide, I have a, uh, an image of the conceptual architecture of the, of the Inspire node in Romania. We tried to keep things separated. So separation of concerns in terms of functionality. Each um, functionality that, requ that Inspire requires, like viewing services, download services, or transformation services, are being hosted on, uh, on separate cluster nodes. Also, we had in mind common use application that can actually leverage the content that is being uh, actively published in the Geo portal and, of course, compliance with law. These are a few of the challenges that we had when implementing, when implementing this, uh, this node. So as I, as I, what I was previously mentioning, separation of concerns, as you can see, this is a conceptual um, representation of the architecture. 
Actually, right now we have more servers in there as capacity requested, uh, as capacity and uh, um, other quality of service uh, key performance indicator. As um, in, in let us know. You know, we understood that we have to we have to expand. Sorry. So we have transformation services which are being served by by uh, a separate cluster download services the geo portal itself, search services, imagery services, everything that you see here is being spread across, uh, across an entire enterprise architecture and it's being balanced by a load balancer and um, we try to uh, ensure security at both um, application level and network level. Um, this was a tedious process, we began in 2009, we are still in in implementing stuff, we uh, we are now in phase two, hopefully going to phase three. And one of the big challenge was the acceptance process that we have to go through. And the Inspire Commission made it hard for us. They released a, 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 a um, validator, so we had to go uh, against that validator. We also had to address quality of service uh, testing. We used heavily SOAP UI and Load UI. How many of you are familiar with this? <laughs> Good tools. And we have been audited by a third party governmental organization for security. This also was a huge process. It took like three months because at the beginning they did not understand how a geoportal should work. They thought it was just a website. And things are totally different. But in the end, we, we managed to get things through with our partner NECPI, we had a big support from on their behalf. Even though they were the beneficiary, they were acti actively involved all the whole time. The whole process for leveraging services began in data harmonization. As I told you, NECPI had lots of information. We have a project. They have a project in Romania, which is called Topro Five. It's the topographic map of Romania, one to five thousand. You'll see now it's one to one thousand. And also we have the land registry, the Romanian Cadastral land, land Registry Project, which is Etera. These were the main source uh, data, uh, data sources that we had to address in uh, harmonizing them and creating services on top of them. We had different problems in, uh, in this process. I just emphasized a few of those. Different storage models, different schemas, different workflows in data, data acquisition and updating process, and also they were stored in the national coordinate system. There was a big problem in transforming this from the national coordinate system to ETRS, but this is a different story. So for, we did this for Annex 1, and so far I can say uh, we have addressed five data themes. Which, uh, it's administrative units, cadastral parcels, geographical names, hydrography, transportation net, and transportation networks. We had to ensure that the TTLs that we've created can be always reused because, uh, as you know, data is alive. It's continuously evolving. And as this happens, we have to ensure a synchronization pro uh, process between the production database and the Inspire database because we could not interrupt their current workflows. They had to maintain the data in their current systems. We just made a bridge for them. And finally, having successfully harmonized the data, we then created five Inspire View services. Only one is available for free right now. NECPI is considering and selling the other four. So administrative units is free. And five Inspire interoperable download services. Only administrative unit is available. Again, cadastral parcel, geographical names, hydrography, and transportation network are being restricted. They are considering on selling them. I don't know, it's their business. We will do as they, they will tell us. We had also this, up, this approach leads to a problem. As I told you, data is alive, so it changes a lot. And this happens in a production environment. We had to ensure synchronization mechanism between that production environment and the inspiring environment. We had to ensure a sound object lifecycle management, and believe me, this is not simple. But as you can see here, we tried to build it right the first time. I still don't think... 
I still think we have a lot of work ahead, but yeah. So for Annex 1, we heavily used the topographic map 1 to 5000 Romania project. You will see it soon. This is a low rate in data change for most data sets and synchronization takes place only once a year. We are continuously updating the data and adding more detail. We began to 1 to 5000, now we are 1 to 1000. I, I will show you that. Um, but in administrative units, for example, we have a medium rate in data change because there are still uh, boundaries that are being disputed by different administrative units. And as this legal process carries on and they agree on different boundaries, we have to make sure that we put that in the geo portal so the public has the access to the latest information. And as a best practice, we identify that it is uh, time saving to actually use S rewards topographic ba uh, uh, base map template. And of course, if we want performance, we have to cache it. We tried dynamic services, but believe me, if you want performance, you have to cache it. So we recaching just for updated areas based on that object lifecycle management policy that we have in place, still a lot to improve there also. In for the cadastral and land registry for cadastral parcels, this is a different story, a different approach. There's a high rate in data change. The data changes daily, even as we speak, transactions are being made in Romania. And by tomorrow, we'll have this transaction in the geo portal. So if a new property is being sold or a new pro property is being uh, registered, we will see it tomorrow. We do the synchronization every night. And this is done automatically. And we also have some reporting mechanism in place that let us, lets us know if anything is okay, if anything went wrong. Um, Heavily used details based on RGS data interoperability and also using SQL. The um, database is an Oracle cluster and we try to use as much as we can the um, functionality that Oracle puts in place like partitioning, like uh, parallel processing and stuff like that. And for cadastral uh, parcel, the data is served dynamically because we, we would not have time to cache it to recache it overnight. There are 10, 000, like 10,000 of transactions per day actually happening. So maybe in the future we are going to, 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 to do this also, but as you'll see, this behaves nicely. I, I will show you just briefly the GeoPortal. I'm not going too much into detail for the GeoPortal. Everybody here knows what the GeoPortal should do. We just put an interface so a uh, citizen or someone who's interested can come and interact with the entire SDI which is behind it. As you can see here we have news that actually this is where we say that new boundaries have been updated and are available for download. But what I want to show you is the data itself in the viewer. As you can see we have national coverage 1 to 1000. We also have orthophotos. This is 2005 flight which was the entire Romania and then these were splitted, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2012. I just want to show you a few things. For example, for Bucharest, this is the level of detail at which we are working, currently updating. And if we zoom in, 1 to 1,000, you also see buildings and addresses. This happens for all of the cities in, in Romania, this level of detail. I just put a few here. These are one, some of the biggest cities in Romania. And I also put a small city just as an example, there so you can see that these cities are also addressed. It's a huge effort and as I told you, any CPI is currently working on it. As soon as we have new data, we help them put it in the system. By now, they can do it by themselves. Also, we also created a, let me just log in. So we also have a download service. We've been using the, how, how many of you are familiar with the, Geo, the S3 Geoportal server? 
Roberto can tell you more about it. I mean, he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's the product manager of Adidas for his part. Yeah. So we try to leverage as much as we can of the capability that GeoPortal has at hand. And believe me, it's an excellent starting point that we build on it. And we're still using some of the functionality that are in there. For example, for download service, we are exploiting behind the, the WFS service. So it's quite simple. I just choose what I want to download. I put a filter. I choose a format. And this is for raster data. We currently don't have raster data. And then hit download. I'll, I'll receive a link from where I can download the, the, the archive. Because this is done asynchronously. It's, there's no point in doing this in real time because um, also we uh, implemented the coordinate transformation system. This was a big problem and I have a problem. This is a problem. This was working previously. Okay. So this happens when we do a live demo. I will see that. We also implement the coordinate transformation system. This is uh, compliant with the, with the draft specification and it allows us to actually transform vector data between national um, coordinate system and ETRS. And it's leveraging the NCPI uh, transformation grid. It's different for me now because of the national coordinate system that we have to use. So in a nutshell, that's about it, about the implementation in, uh, in Romania for the Inspire node. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucien. Yeah, yeah. I think what is very nice of this presentation, I think, is uh, that it's not a static uh, snapshot of, of the data, but it's actually a live system where you can see the updates and, and actually all the maps and the data reflect those. Yeah, I'm uh, going to show the, but you can also come at the booth to see the cadastral parcel data and stuff like that, which is more interesting. Yes, yeah. So please stop at the booth to know more. The same for other apps. I'd like to... Um, now have Mark presenting the um, some other projects on with uh, data harmonization as the primary focus of the task. Yeah, thank you very much, Roberto. As Lucian said, um, in many cases we have to care about that the data will st will still stay in their production systems and that we not all want to change our productive systems to the Inspire data model that we just have to harmonize the data into the Inspire data model and um, I will show you how we can build these bridges with ETL technology. Uh, Lucien talked a lot about or and, and some uh, gave some little hints about um, the data interoperability extension which is basically FME technology in the background and I will show you how this technology in general works and how we extend this technology to make your life even simpler or easier because um, we have an extension on top of it uh, which helps you to harmonize Inspire relevant data. Um, this is the general workflow I will talk about and I will cover or focus on the, on, on the data harmonization part and um, I will first talk about the, the first approach to use uh, Inspire GeoDatabase as a destination and how we can get data into this Inspire GeoDatabase. So first we will cover all the NX1 topics and some of the NX2 topics are already existing in this GeoDatabase and I think we will see some of the data NX Data 3 models in the near future. Um, so this, this general approach will work for, for the most of the Inspire topics. So the general idea is uh, to extract Inspire relevant data and this is important only the Inspire relevant data. Uh, uh, then we want to transform this into the Inspire schema which is described in the Inspire specification and then we will load this into the Inspire geodatabase and out of, the, out of this geodatabase we can directly use a workflow which is pre-configured in the, in, the, in the product to create a view and download services uh, and coverage services as well. So the general workflow is that we will use the Inspire schema, that we want to we will import this source schema into the FME workbench, which I will show you later on. 
uh, then we have to describe the schema mapping. This part is not an automated part, this has to be done manually and I will talk a little bit about some projects where we've, where, where, where we've done this, these data harmonizations together with customers. So this is important from our point of view. We cannot do this as a service. This is, we can show you the general proceeding, but um, you have to know the data very well to do this schema harmonization. And we can show you how the tools are working and we can support you, but only these guys who are very familiar with, with the source data are able to do the schema trans or to describe the schema uh, transformation. And afterwards, after the schema transformation is described, we can load data into the pre-configured Inspire Geo database. Yeah, as I said, we did this in a bunch of projects around about Europe. The most of them are located in Germany as well because we are located in Germany. Um, and yeah, interesting for you, I think, is um, that we, the most of these projects are quite small, to be honest. So this is our support. Um, this is not the whole project. So at the customer side, in many cases, the efforts are much higher because they are describing this, the schema matching uh, or schema mapping uh, transformation itself. But we support them and um, just to, to provide the knowledge to, um, to do the schema mapping part, it's about two days and to do um, a lot of the schema on our side, it's about 15, 20 days. So just to give you some numbers that you can imagine how, how big the efforts for just for this schema transformation is. Um, and it depends on, the, on your source data. If your soft source data is in a really good shape, if, if it has a high quality, if it is uh, stored in one system, it's even easier uh, than if you have a very distributed data and very bad quality in your data. So in many cases, the, the quality or the real quality of your data will become out if you do a migration. So um, we did this, um, and this is a very good example for the German uh, Federal Agency of, for Nature Con uh, Conservation in, uh, in the past month. Uh, I think Zorn will have uh, a talk about that. Uh, probably Thomas, sorry. Uh, within the next, it's tomorrow, so um, then it's more detailed. I just want to mention that we um, do this for, uh, for two annex themes, for the protected sites and the distribution, uh, species distribution, and this is important because um, this covers two approaches. This, let's say, the old approach or the first approach to fill the, the geo database and the second approach to deliver pre-configured GML data and predefined data sets. So for the protected sites, we can use uh, the, the um, Inspire Geo database and for the species distribution, we will create GML and we will publish this GML as an atom feed and then we will uh, describe um, metadata using a CSW service and then we can transform the CSW directly into an atom feed. Yeah, how we do this? In general, we are using FME technology. As we said, it's spatial ETL. ETL stands for Extract Transform Load. It comes from Safe Software, which is located in uh, Vancouver, this company. And uh, yeah, in general, it's about translating data. So it reads and writes around about 300 spatial formats. It's, it has a lot of functionalities to transform data, so to to change the, the schema of the data, to, to uh, create new attributes, to do quality checks on, on, on the attributes. All this yeah, well-known tiny little things when, when you migrate data are, um, are delivered, or functionalities are delivered by Safe Software. And afterwards, we can integrate the data into this database, which is delivered with Actia as in, for Inspire. And afterwards, um, we can distribute the data. So the workbench itself, and this is the, the main product or the main uh, component of FME, uh, works from the left to the right. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, the input data model. On the right-hand side, you have the output data model. And in, the, in between, you can describe your schema mapping. I've prepared a short little video. 
which shows a very, very simple um, example from ZSV to shape. We have uh, just a ZSV file with, with coordinates in it, uh, which we can read with the FME workbench. Um, every reader has, has its own parameter, so if you uh, read data from the Oracle database, for example, you have different parameters you can uh, you can uh, describe which tables you would like to read. In our case, it's just a ZSV file. The FME Workbench interprets this, the source schema of the ZSV file. You can describe that you have an X and Y, that you will use uh, a geo object, or that you will create a geo object or a vertex out of this um, uh, X and Y coordinate. And uh, it has a, a little preview. It's called a universal viewer. Yeah, you can, this is more debugger. You can use this to, to show the data. This just shows now these 50,000 little points. And afterwards you can try to connect the data. So FME can totally change the, the shape of, of the data, the objects, the aggregation of your data. So even if it's non-spatial data, we can make special data out of it. Even if it's uh, distributed information in, in many systems, we can merge or fuse this data together and join this data and bring this data afterwards into the Inspire Geo database. In this case, um, we will use the point connector to create lines out of these points. And the last step is always to define the destination format uh, to describe the whole process from the source to the destination format. So this is how FME works in general. One question, who is familiar with FME technology or, or already is using FME technology? Okay. Yeah, the last step is just to define the destination schema and in, in our case um, this, uh, this destination schema is delivered by ArcGIS for Inspire and we will see later on how we use this for our Inspire solution pack. So the Inspire solution pack for FME is an extension which, sit, which sits on top of FME. So we deliver at the moment um, for all NX1 themes uh, workbench templates. The work temp workbench templates are pre-configured workbenches which have n no source uh, data information in there because we, we cannot integrate your existing uh, um, systems there but it's easy for you <coughs> to integrate them there but what's already integrated is the destination schema of the Inspire Geo database and a lot of uh, pre-configured transformers and then you have to integrate your existing uh, systems and your existing uh, source data and um, afterwards you have an individu individual map mapping part and a pre-configured mapping part uh, which you can or which which describes the whole mapping process afterwards so the inspire solution pack itself has a lot of functionality in there to help you uh, to describe the Inspire uh, specific uh, transformation and schema. For example, for the administrative units, we have a template. And as you can see, it's not so complex. And we have uh, pre-configured transformers in there. These transformers are describing, for example, specific mandatory attributes with the specific um, um, attribute um, values. and um, for example, the um, uh, the reasons, the void reasons are directly described, and the uh, the attribute values itself. For example, for legal status, it's possible to uh, to fill in agreed or not agreed. So this is pre-configured, and always the main question is what does agreed or not agreed mean, and we. We integrated the Inspire help and uh, additional help into the workbench interface that, do, that you do not have to read the whole specification and you cannot get lost into, the, into this whole specification because uh, we call this context sensi sensitive help. This, this information snippet is always there if you need this in the mapping process. 
So this is the general idea behind this. Uh, the, the time is not enough to describe it uh, in detail today or in this, in this session, but if you, if you are interested, we can do it afterwards in our booth. Um, yeah, these are the, uh, the, the benefits. So as I said, we have uh, lots of additional transformers which are helping you to, to describe the whole process. We have this workbench templates and this context-sensitive help. Um, that's it about the FME um, solution pack at the moment, which um, interesting for you, I think, could be the road ahead to 2020. Uh, Roberto described shortly the, the whole um, time schedule of Inspire. And uh, for ISP 2.0, this is our, our description for the next step. Uh, we will uh, deliver workbenches which do not um, uh, uh, fill the Inspire GU database, which create directly predefined GML, and uh, which, which are creating atom feeds, and you can use this package of data to publish the data with ArcGIS for Inspire afterwards. Um, so um, at, this, at this point, the, the approach changes a little bit at the moment, um, but we will see how, how, um, how we will handle this in the near future. Um, the workbench templates itself will be um, uh, not delivered from the first day. Um, we will use uh, the FME uh, store for that. So we will do it for, uh, yeah, for around about five to ten uh, uh, NX themes, which are the most, most common. And afterwards we will do it case by case and we will publish them of the, over the FME store uh, and over the community. So this is the general idea, and then I can head over uh, to Clemens, I think. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I think we need to uh, think. Please use the mic. <laughs> the mic. And again, question, will you keep the question for, for the final part of the session? All right, so um, I will be talking about um, an European activity. So right now it's a, it's a European project, the European Location Framework, but it's basically it's just a three-year project to kickstart uh, an operational infrastructure that should be set up. And I will be talking about a specific part of of the work that, that we are doing. It's, it's actually really a very minor part. Um, if you look at the, at the overall um, project activities, um, it's probably about 5% of the work or, or even less. What I will be talking about is uh, about taking the Inspire uh, data, the reference data, that's what the European Location Framework is about. And uh, what we're doing is um, publishing it in ArcGIS Online to make it available in, in the ArcGIS platform. And I'm going to motivate that a little bit. <clears throat> so that's basically a um, simplified overview of, of what um, the European Location Framework is. And let's say the, the core of uh, the, what the um, uh, mapping agencies, uh, who are the main contributors uh, for the data, <clears throat> Uh, they contribute the data and, and they will be setting up and are setting up uh, at the moment uh, Inspire services or enriched Inspire services that have additional data. So that's, that's the ELF uh, extensions to Inspire. So they, they are setting up view and download services as we have seen in, in, in the previous presentations as well. Um, in addition to, to that, um, there will be other data from authoritative data from NSDIs and potentially other data that, that will be brought into as well. What I will be focusing on is that next step that basically sits on top of this Inspire infrastructure um, <coughs> and uh, um, <coughs> where we are using ArcGIS online to make it available. So what we have created in, 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 in ELF is the notion of an ELF affiliated platform. So what the mapping agencies are doing, that's that's what we call the ELF platform. That's run by by the uh, by the by the authorities, um, <coughs> and the ELF affiliated uh, platform concept, where ArcGIS is the the only one in the project, but it could be extended to others uh, as well, is um, that we want to extend the reach of 
of the of the inspired data. Um, so <clears throat> to give you an, an, an overview is uh, the, the motivation size that we want to um, go to uh, environments, platforms where which have a large number of, of users, uh, so so that 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 are willing to tap into that, that support um, all major devices, uh, so smartphones, tablets, uh, computers, etc. Uh, <clears throat> and 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 the key factor is that um, today, if you get the Inspire data, you download the Inspire data. Uh, most most users um, are not really. It's not simple for them to get the data into their tools they are using. So that's the main reason why we are um, <coughs> uh, uh, having this concept, where we say we need to convert the data and make it available to users in the environments that they are using, uh, so that it's really easy for them to use Inspire data. And uh, right now you have to do you have to download the data, you transform it into your own environment. So you basically that's resource intensive. Um, <clears throat> you need a lot of expertise that many users don't have and don't want to want to acquire. And that's that's also the case not only for end users but also for for application developers. Um, so so the key is really to have it ready for immediate use with the tools that the people are using today. Um, <clears throat> so bringing basically inspire data and reference data to 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 what they are using. Um, <clears throat> So, and, and most of it, I think it's what we expect is that all these affiliate platforms will basically be cloud-based um, and also to support scalability, elasticity, etc. Because if you look also at Inspire um, <coughs> quality of service requirements, they are demanding for, for, for most uh, uh, organizations to set up, but it's still um, they have capacities of 20, 50 parallel users, and for many applications, that may not be enough. So, <clears throat> if we look at what ArcGIS offers, it already covers a lot of it because it supports all the major devices. It, it uh, uh, from smartphones, tablets, uh, PCs. It supports the web. It supports Java. So you have all the different operating system. Uh, Mac OS X, Windows, so, so you have the, the basic technologies, they're all covered by, by the rich API and then you have good support, you have an active developer community, so it's relatively, if you have the data in the platform, it's relatively straightforward to quickly uh, build applications, develop applications. So what we need to focus, we don't need to focus a lot on documentation and developer support, what we need to focus on on how we actually make the data available, and that's that's what <coughs> um, I will be showing now. So, so that's basically if you go to ELF map, that's maps. Sorry, uh, maps.arcgis.com, uh, then then you should see that. Except for you will see less maps on there because if um, there is only a, a small set of data that is publicly available, most of the data is currently limited only to the to the consortium members that's that's ongoing uh, <coughs> to, to see the conditions to make that available you can see there I'm logged in um, so I can see more more data more maps more more applications what do we currently have it, have in there it's uh, mostly existing European data sets so Euro global map Euro regional map Euro boundary map where we are starting to actually transform that from the original status, so that's the, the current pan-European products of the European mapping agencies, but we are starting to convert that to the ELF and Inspire specification. So there are some structural changes that, that you currently, you don't see it, for example, in Euro Global Map, but um, <coughs> Euro Boundary Map, we already called it ELF Administrative and Statistical Units uh, Feature Service. So you still have the boundary Euro boundary map data underlying it, but it's it's converted to uh, <coughs> to, to to the Inspire speci specifications. We also do have a base map, preliminary base map that we create from. So that's map tiles again, cached services for good performance, based on some preliminary specifications, portrayal specifications that is used by mapping agencies, but that will be be also. Um, extended. <coughs> and we do have several examples there uh, for application developers, uh, sample web maps, sample web applications, uh, I'm going to show that as well. 
hopefully soon we'll also take master level data. So what we have here is small and medium scale data. Um, but what we're mostly interested in, of course, is um, <coughs> taking the Inspire data on the master level, so talking about 1 to 50,000, 1 to 10,000 uh, scale, and add that, but we need to wait until the necessary agreements are in place uh, so that we can actually take the data and also under which we can then make it available to application developers and users. <coughs> when we look at how we actually integrate it in ArcGIS, um, so we basically focus on three different patterns that we want to support. Um, <clears throat> uh, how the Inspire data is really used. So when we think about how, how are people using Inspire data on the web. If we're not just taking the data and wanting to download it and then use it somehow in my environment, but that we want to make it available so that people can use it directly at the point of where, where it's accessible. So the most simple thing is you just have a background map, there's no interaction, you don't really need the data. Uh, so the, the reference data in that sense is just in my eyes, because I see other data on top of it, and because you have the reference data in the background map, you, can, uh, you, you have location context for your other data. The second is <coughs> preparing, well, what's, that's a term that we used in, in the Inspire data specifications for non-spatial data where we prepare business data, I have an example using statistical data um, <clears throat> uh, later on, uh, and, and which has no georeference, no explicit georeference, and where we can use the data that we have there to provide georeference to it, to geocode it essentially. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is then to use feature data directly in, in applications. In, in that step, to support these three basic use cases, <clears throat> Um, what we do is when we take the data, the Inspire data, we basically, so far, this is work in, work in progress and we are, we are learning um, as, as we are doing that and, and working with the data. Um, we basically do two, uh, four things in the transformation from the Inspire data um, to what we have in, in the ArcGIS services. Um, and the first is we flatten the structures. That is basically a, a necessary thing because of the platform that we are using mostly. Um, <clears throat> so so um, data, feature data is following a tabular structure. You have a geometry associated with it. Um, but that also makes it much easier for um, application developers, in particular those who are not necessarily geospecialists and, and the data specialists, to actually handle the data with the, with the APIs and tools that they have. Second thing is, we do reduce some content. So there's the data, um, I think the, the data specifications are often too rich in content and it's, it's kind of overwhelming. So um, we, we take away some of the data in particular where we only have information from smaller parts of Europe uh, and, and to, have, to have simpler data that is also easier to manage. But that of course you will not um, that will not be the right thing then for everyone, but that's kind of an approach and, and finding the balance is still also something that we are working on. Um, then we're also using additional capabilities that the platform has. Uh, Build-in support for time, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, feature relationships, um, which are also in the, in the data specification, but are, are somewhat in a slightly different way in, in the ArcGIS platform, and we're making use of that and attachments. And the other thing is that we're also making, for the direct use of the feature data and apps, we're also making some changes to the feature type structures. Um, <clears throat> an example that we, that we have in that administrative unit service, so in Inspire administrative unit is one feature type, which covers all the different levels. But when you use it in a map-based app, you usually want to see on a certain scale, a certain level, on another scale, another level. Uh, so we actually created six layers uh, from for administrative units, so you can uh, <coughs> you can you can see the the appropriate level uh, depending on the map scale that you're looking at. So that's the basic things what we are changing um, in the Inspire data specifications when we load it into into ArcGIS. <coughs> the other thing then, of course, when we want to use that data in in applications directly. Uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, that uh, um, influence the user experience and 
um, what we see is that there are a few things that are uh, in, in the ArcGIS feature service uh, <coughs> that are really good for good support for actually making that a smooth experience for user. So one, one of it is explicit support for HTTP caching. So um, <coughs> it basically the, the service supports that and then also the, the APIs on top of it, like the JavaScript API, they, what they actually do is they ask for the data in vector tiles also, when they ask for vector data, they also split it into tiles just like, like with, a, with a map service. So they can see, the server then sees if something has changed in that tile and it says nothing has changed. So um, <clears throat> once you have the data in your client, when you zoom and pen, it's a much smoother uh, user experience. You don't, it doesn't reload it again just because you do a small uh, a pen of, of the map window. Um, another thing is generalization, um, which is of course most, mostly important. Administrative unit is already a good example, um, <clears throat> where you have uh, lots of uh, coordinates in a feature geometry and depending on if you have a map-based application, you're looking at it as a certain scale. And it doesn't make any sense to give you all the detailed coordinates of Germany if you're looking at it at a 1 to 10 million scale. So what it actually does, it, it generalizes, reduces coordinates. I have some examples of the changes in the size. Uh, so from 10 to 4, 10.4 uh, megabyte, that's for one of these tiles. And if I ask for the same area in 1 to 37 million, it's just 250 kilobytes. That not only reduces the time that you get it, but also it, it puts a lower footprint on the client. Memory in the client is an important aspect when it goes to smoothness of loading and, and working with the data. And then of course what we do have is we have scale and rendering hints that are provided by the service. So there's a proposal, you don't have to follow that when you render something, but there's a proposal what the portrayal is for that feature type depending on the attributes and also what are the appropriate scale levels where to show uh, a certain feature type. Uh, a client can override that, but it's easier when integrating the data for the first time, time in an application. Um, <clears throat> so let me just show you three small examples of, of data that we currently have in there. That's actually a, um, publicly available uh, because that uses EuroGlobalMap, which is open data since uh, uh, some time, and just using three sample layers, using airports, airfields, um, elevation points and build-up areas on top of um, one of the ESRI provided topographic maps. Um, <clears throat> so you can, you can see the, the blue ones are the, the airports, airfields, you have the elevation points here in the, from the Alps and, and also the build-up areas, Milan, Torino, etc. <clears throat> um, and for example, you can, you can also type that, it works on all the different devices, as I said, you can, you can take that you are able to type it in your um, smartphone or tablet and then you should get, get the, the result and, and also be able to access it on your, on your uh, uh, phone. <clears throat> Another one is the administrative and statistical unit and, and the ELF base map, using the ELF base map. Uh, that's another example that we have. And the, um, <clears throat> the final one is actually the a georeferencing result is taking some uh, population density data from Eurostat and georeferencing it uh, against the uh, NUTS uh, regions that we have in our feature services. Um, to do that, what we did is actually to have a completely cloud-based solution so that it can, can run always automated and unattended. You can run it periodically or trigger it. So we're using also an FME workbench here that's not running on my computer but we published it in the in the FME cloud. Uh, that accesses the Eurostat website. Um, we use the CSV or TSV files um, but you could also use the, the SDMX library. We access the, the population density data. We access the, the workbench accesses the ELF feature service with the statistical units and then uh, creates or in, in future runs it updates um, <clears throat> that service, the feature service with the population density data and it created that because um, in, in our own organization, Interactive Instruments organization, 
uh, and to, to make it available. Um, <clears throat> so I will also be giving a talk on Wednesday covering some of these topics, looking a little bit more into the simplifications and changes that we're doing um, when we create, um, let's say, inspire data on, a, on a, um, uh, an, an another platform. Um, and, and of course, we're also available. There's a Eurogeographics ELF booth and, and also, uh, of course, the Esri booth. What I will quickly want to show um, <clears throat> at the end is potentially, um, so, so that's, that's, for example, the potential uh, population density web map. We see the three layers. We have uh, uh, the, the base map <clears throat> um, and we can see here, um, yeah, the data, it goes back to 1997. Um, <clears throat> what I want to show is if I just uh, to, to publish that as an application, let me just add also another value at the, just to demonstrate that I'll take the, the build up areas that we have also seen from Euro Global Map. We can add that and then, so it looks a bit and then I can, can change that uh, to a better name. Um, <clears throat> I can also change the, configure the pop-up, change the symbols. Let me just do that. I can select the field, population, um, use a different color, get rid of the boundaries. <clears throat> Um, so let me let me say I, I'm, I'm done with with doing that. And um, <clears throat> what I want to present to users is then something that has less options. Um, and and to do that, what you do is you can share it then as an application. So you can share the web map with others, um, but you could also make a web application out of it. Um, there are pre-configured templates that Esri provides, and we've seen some of them in in Roberto's. Presentation storytelling is, is also one of, one of these templates. What we have done here is um, <clears throat> we've created our own ELF um, application templates, a very simple one, but using, um, I can preview that so I don't have to save it, uh, <clears throat> using the Map Apps technology from Conterra, which is also using the, the Esri JavaScript API, <clears throat> um, and it, it's, it's mostly standard uh, um, <clears throat> web application. It includes a little bit of branding of it and, and some uh, specific things about <clears throat> information and about uh, the, the source in history. And that's then how it looks um, for the user. So he has less um <clears throat> options of what he can do. He still has all the legend. He can get all the information, zoom in can also select the, the content that he wants to see, um, <clears throat> etc. Um, and, and, and so then I can make that available, share that with, with others, and they can use it just like we saw it in the storytelling example. That's basically the same thing and, and make that available to the public. Okay, that's, with that I hand over back to you, Roberto. Thank you, Clemens. Okay, um, I have a few um, slides. One is to complete if you go in the um, resource center, resources.mgs.com, you will find a link to the geodatabase template that we were uh, uh, talking about before for the data harmonization process. You can download it uh, with the documentation and it implements uh, Annex 1 data models. And um, again, like Lucian uh, has been also mentioning GeoPortal Server, which is one component of, of the Inspire solution. It's a, a open source, it's Apache 2.0 license. <clears throat> um, it 
It is the component that we use to achieve compliance with metadata, inspired metadata and inspired discovery service that you can use. And again, if you have more questions about these components or the specific use cases, please stop at the booth. Um, I'm more than, or we are more than happy to provide more details. Um, I'd like to have one slide also on, on uh, quality. Um, it's transparency or publishing uh, data also has to deal with data quality. There is a, a, a tool that is called Data Reviewer that you can use in RJS in, well, in desktop or in the server environment. So for, for also for others to use to validate data or, or QA data. Um, it's more than only the, it's more than detecting errors. It's a tool that allows you to cooperate and track changes and make comments and, and sort of consolidate the data, not just find that there is an error. So it's uh, extremely flexible. It's, uh, uh, you can run as a batch, so you can use uh, basically define an extent in your map and say, please run it. And then you, again, you have a versioning system that allows you to cooperate with others that will fix the errors and, and come up with um, uh, a, a newer version of the database. So this is just an example. There are 42 data checks that are predefined and you can actually configure those by actually interrogating the exact fields that you are interested in and, and uh, uh, basically focus on that. Um, as I've been talking about um, um, bringing maps in other environments, I hope the change of resolution isn't uh, confused. Where am I? I'm too far away. Why doesn't... Oops, I think is the resolution in the change, but basically um, let me see if I can add. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's a very low resolution here. What I did here, at least with the resolution I had before, is to load the same elevation points that Clemens has been using on the browser in, in my Excel spreadsheet. Um, I can find it. It doesn't zoom out now. Okay, here we go. Maybe it's simply, <laughs> simply. Um, it should zoom out. Yeah, let me see. So that's that's a way. Um, it's important. To um, this is a sort of key message. The the um, and actually I was looking at the World Cup statistics, but uh, it's a key message. You can actually not only load maps, but you can actually integrate with layers that you can build in Excel. So uh, you can download from Eurostat a CSV file, uh, drop in Excel, load a map with layers that you have in your uh, in RGS Online. Not now. Um, and, and visualize a map that is also not only the, uh, the layers that you have online, but also some statistics. So here I just played with statistics on the World Cup. So you can actually change the values and the symbology and the map will change accordingly. So it's, um, it's uh, a way to collaborate. You can, only, uh, you can not only build maps or load maps, but you can feedback maps that go in, again in the same platform. So if you add a layer here, you can publish that in the same WebJS platform and uh, bring that with other layers in, in the organization. Um, and uh, to conclude, for application developers, we have a number of uh, technology, like Clemens has been a little bit mentioning, uh, especially for JavaScript, which is on the web, the most common uh, technology now. We have also uh, uh, API for 3D and, uh, and an application builder that you can use. Plus, for those who are in need of or prefer 
to leverage the, uh, the iOS or Android specific capabilities, you can also still develop native and leverage uh, 3D local file systems and so on that are made available by that specific operating system. So with this, I'd like to um, open the floor for questions and, and invite here also the other presenters. So if you have any question about what you have seen, uh, please uh, raise your hands. Any question? Probably you are thinking to lunch. <laughs> uh, but if you have any question now or later, oh, please. Um, just a question. I don't know if you Clemens or our Romanian colleagues, because you were talking about. Just one question on the time awareness of your services. I saw it now that you have implemented with the ELF and you're harvesting from Eurostat the SDMX data or CSV. But how do you ensure that actually, for example, your NUTS data or your administrative data are that you can select this one as well? Are these services also time aware? Well, I would need, for example, to have a NUTS data or administrative data from 2000. How do we do that? Is that possible? To be honest, I don't think it's possible with ELF at the moment um, because it's the latest data. So we do have timestamp information, so we can we can timestamp that. But uh, <clears throat> so we can only the services, basically the feature services, are time aware. So I can point, but then it depends on the data that we have in the background. And of course, if you create this, let's say this population density map thing, then you would have to make a decision on how you merge. 1990 population data with 2013 nuts areas. I don't have a solution for that. I think what the main point is we have the technology that the technology is there to find solutions if we get the proper data uh, in place, right? So, so and and that maybe I think right now speaking about ELF, it's about the most up to date reference data. But let's say I think it depends on demands. Um, whether whether there's also a case for providing that uh, uh, history or archiving that potentially, or we would need to be see how to actually do that. Other questions? I would have one, but I'm not sure I can formulate it properly. I'll give it a try. <laughs> uh, in the presentation from the gentleman from Conterra, from Conterra, I saw that you were showing how you can how you can arrange for transferring your data in, in almost whatever format you have against those uh, UML which is available from the Inspire implementation rules from the data specification. So for Annex 1 you are doing this, for Annex 2 somewhat, for Annex 3 um, now, what kind of problems are you encountering with that? Some of these data specifications are rather uh, broad, rather broad, rather generic on one hand. On the other hand, if you leave a lot of space, you showed that this is a semi-automated process or almost a manual process. I mean, you open up uh, all kinds of, I mean, basically the user can choose to do whatever mappings they feel free to do. Uh, have you thought about how to kind of constrain this a little bit more because at least we would like to kind of learn and, and get to some common mappings over time. I'm aware that the understanding for this and the maturity for this is probably not always there and so it's very hard for you to, to hard code those mappings but uh, on the other hand now there is this flexible thing there and uh, I mean, one could do whatever and then call it, we have um, done the Inspire mapping with the, with the nice uh, ArcGIS, in the nice ArcGIS environment, so maybe we are then Inspire conformant. I mean, are we that? We are, pro I mean, those type of questions, have you been thinking about them and uh, can you maybe share some of the reflections you had? Did you, was that understandable? Yeah. yeah. Mark, do you want to start? I can start, yeah. Yeah, first of all, um, it's a good question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we've thought of, of, of that at the beginning of our development. So, 
in general, it would be possible to uh, to uh, hard code uh, um, schema transformations if you have a standard, a local standard, for example, in Germany. As it is uh, uh, the AAA standard for cadastral data, we can write for this standard a hard-coded schema transformation. But in the most cases, we are expecting data in productive systems, unharmonized, so from customer to customer or from, uh, from authority to author authority in total different uh, uh, yeah, productive systems. These are historical systems, historical grown systems, and they're all different. And we, to tr we tried to build a solution which is as flexible as possible and as easy as possible to use. So, and then we came up with the, with the idea to create generic workbench templates. And the only thing we we could integrate, which is the common denominator, is the destination schema, which is brought with the Inspire Geo database with the, with this product, or with the new product or with the new um, approach, just with the Inspire GML. If we if we directly create Inspire GML out of this um, ins out, out of these FME workspaces. So um, the ins Inspire way is, is more generic on the destination side, but still the same problem on the, on the source data sets. Um, we expect um, totally different uh, input schemas. So, um, and we will happy if, if you know, for example, for geology or for, for other uh, specific themes, if, if, if customer know uh, knows uh, 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 a used standard or a de facto standard, um, we would be happy to, to, to build a pre-mapped uh, uh, schema mapping for that. Some, some communities will probably come with this sooner or later, and then yeah. you call it template <coughs> or however, and then you can load it as well into your yeah. workbench. Yeah. So, so just to give you an example, again from the European Location Framework uh, activity, where all the mapping agencies, they have different source data, right? Everybody uses a different standard for their topographic data. And oh, the approach followed there is, so what we, what we do create from the UML specifications, from the data specifications, are Excel workbooks automatically. That's, that's used by, by a tool that's also used to create the XML schema files, et cetera. And, 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 and they document their mapping. And I think because you raised the question about what does compliance mean, et cetera, how to, to make a way to understand the mapping. And I think that that's one potential step. I think uh, going into implementation aspects, that's potentially several steps at once because there needs to be a better understanding. But I think in, in for the question on did they do it right, what did they do, is, is documentation. And, and there's currently no agreed documentation format. I think you're using these Excel t workbooks as well. And yeah. so I think that might be a thing that uh, there is a common documentation, how people doc uh, uh, make it available. And that's easier than also for others to look at to get an understanding. But beyond that, to an implementation level, will be difficult except for specific formats. Maybe just to add one more uh, dimension to the problem. So the, um, one way to interpret your, your, your question is also there are a number of optional or um, you know, options within, within the obligations and, uh, and uh, the multiplicities that uh, may be zero for some data providers because they, they don't have that situation or maybe more than one. And what we are trying to do from, from the development point of view is to try to capture some community specific requirements that we try to, to receive from you um, that go beyond the compliance. Uh, and uh, as I said, we started with land cover and geology and we tried to really capture what would make sense to have, what would be a question I want to be able to answer uh, once I have Inspire. Um, and that's one way to also come up with a compliant <coughs> implementation and at the same time something that is a best practice. Any other question?
Well, my question is about the European location framework. So it seems that uh, from the demo, it's uh, from what I've been reading, seems to be very focused on RJS Online and using this technology. Are you considering any other cloud infrastructure that is not RJS Online? Um, so, as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> in the project, in the current project, it's focused on ArcGIS Online. Also, in the ELF platform, there is also cloud uh, infrastructure used um, that's developed by the, the um, mapping agencies. Um, and there will also be talks about that as well. But then, I mean, there's, there are other environments like, I don't know, Google Maps Engine or Mapbox or w whatever you can think of. Um, and, and I think they are not part of the current activity, but might be, let's say, if this pattern of really bringing the Inspire data to these other environments where people are, which people are using and developing applications, then I think it eventually it will depend on the business model for these kind of activities. But it's something that we are exploring, and I think it has a lot of potential. Any other question? Okay, so thank you for uh, attending this uh, uh, workshop. We'll be here the whole week, so if you have any follow-up question, please stop at the booth. Thank you.